So uh, welcome everyone to the third class in the five part series on China. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes here. Um, so for those of you who've already uh, tuned into live stream, please share the live stream onto your own uh, Facebook page or Twitter and all your social media so more people can tune in. You can also start a watch party at this time uh, so your friends, your uh, everyone in your network can also tune into the class. Um, and while we're reading, you can also drop um, in the chat uh, the name of the city or the town that you're watching from. Uh, so we can read those out, me and Candice. Um, and if you attended um, yesterday's uh, car caravan protest, the cancel the rent protest, or you helped organize them, please post in the chat about those as well. Uh, we want to know how they went in your city or your town. Uh, we want to know by your experience. Um, and finally, um, if you're participating in, in or have helped organize protests around police brutality, or if you're doing solidarity actions in your city or town, um, in solidarity with the protesters in Minneapolis and Atlanta who are demanding uh, justice for George Floyd um, and all the victims of um, you know, racist police terror. We want to hear about your experiences. Yeah, so comrades in San Diego had a um, cancel the rent car caravan and over 100 people showed up. That's amazing. And then they also participated in the La Mesa uprising afterwards with thousands of protesters. Uh, in Seattle, there was also a caravan of modest size, but it was well received as they drove through working class neighborhoods and then they joined a mass protest for demanding justice for George Floyd. And then in Buffalo, New York, um, comrades att attended a protest there and chanted justice for George Floyd and we can't breathe. And they kneeled for eight minutes at one point as well. Um, in Ithaca, New York, comrades went to car protests and they don't have an exact count, but there are at least 100 people and 50 cars there as well. So I think we can go ahead and get started at this time. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Satya. I'm an organizer with the Albuquerque branch of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Um, I will be facilitating today with Candace, an organizer with the Chicago branch of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the PSL. Um, so before we begin the class, uh, we want to recognize the incredible uh, mass protest against injustice um, that is spreading across this country. Uh, Derek Shawin, with the help of three other cops, brutally murdered George Floyd on May 25th after a surge in racist and in racist police violence targeting Black people. Ahmad Arbery was killed while running in Georgia. Breonna Taylor was killed in her home in Kentucky, and Dredson Sean Reed was killed in Indianapolis by police who then cracked jokes about his death. While the media is doing its best to characterize protesters as violent and looting as a central issue, we know the opposite is true. The police are the violent institution and the protests are a justified reaction to racism and brutality. The understandable rage and militant action that is continuing in cities throughout the United States is a rebellion against continual racist police brutality for which no one is held accountable. This is a rebellion not only against racist police killings, it is a rebellion against poverty, against mass unemployment. The protesters are being demonized as outside agitators in all 50 states. As if angry, fed up young people had to travel to other cities to protest rather than engaging in resistance in the place they actually live. This allegation, no matter how many times it is repeated in the mass media, is a lie. The protesters are demonized too as looters. Yes, poor people are angry. They are fed up with the status quo. 
But let's be real. This country has already been looted by the billionaires and bankers, and it is they who are receiving nearly $5 trillion in bailout monies from the federal government and Federal Reserve Bank, while the masses of working people are given crumbs. We salute the huge numbers of people who have come out to protest in every state of this country. We in the PSL will continue to be in the streets demanding justice for all victims of police brutality, demanding the full prosecution of killer cops and an end to racist police terror. We will also keep, keep up our nationwide campaign to cancel the rents until the end of the pandemic crisis. We are proud that over 75 cities took part in yesterday's car caravan protests demanding cancellation of rents and justice for George Floyd. Great, thank you, Satya. And as Satya said, I will be co-facilitating today's class. Uh, just so everyone is aware, this class is being live streamed. So if folks are watching on Facebook or Twitter, we ask that you take a moment to share this live stream and invite others to tune in. Last Sunday, we focused on the years between 1919 to 1949, national liberation through class struggle. The recording of the first and second classes can be viewed on liberationschool.org for those of you who missed it. Today's class taught by members of the Party for Socialism and Liberation will focus on the period of 1949 to 1979, the twin tasks of the revolution. Today is the third class in a five-part series that examines the construction of modern day China in the context of global imperialism. Starting from the very first opium war between China and Britain in the early 1800s, we also dive into China's century-long national liberation struggle and the construction of socialism. The purpose of the class is to provide the necessary context for understanding modern China today faced with the constant aggression from U.S. imperialism. The Party for Socialism and Liberation is organizing this class a series along with the Chow Collective as part of our response to the outrageous demonization campaign against China that continues to grow amidst this crisis. We invite all those watching to find out more about both organizations and to get involved in the struggle today. Visit www.chowcollective.com. Chow is spelled Q-I-A-O. For more information about the Chow Collective and www.pslweb.org, to learn about the Party for Socialism and Liberation. The last two classes in this series will be, um, so the fourth class in the series will be on June 7th, and the topic will be, Is China Capitalist? On China's Socialist Market Economy and Quest Towards Socialism, taught by the Chow Collective. And then on June 14th, that will be the final class in the series, and that will cover China and the Global South, internationalism and multilateralism amidst U.S. aggression taught by the Chow Collective. Um, so today, Ken Hammond and Sheila Shao will be our presenters. Ken Hammond is a PSL member in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University and former director of the Confucius Institute. Sheila Shao is a member of the PSL Central Committee. She also works in public higher education as an institutional researcher. So today's class will consist of two lectures, um, each followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. For each Q&A session, we will open up for questions and comments. Uh, we are keeping track of unanswered questions and we'll be posting answers to liberationschool.org. Um, webinar participants, please write your questions into the chat. We also have comrades monitoring um, the Facebook chat. Uh, so, so please post your questions on uh, the Facebook chat as well. Candice and I will present the questions to the presenters uh, to respond during the question and answer time. Today, Ken Hammond will be presenting the first lecture on establishing the PRC, building socialism in the 1950s, the Great Leap Forward, and the Sino-Soviet split. Welcome, Ken. 
Good to be here again. Hi, comrades. Uh, glad to be carrying our, our class forward. Uh, obviously, these are turbulent times and times in which uh, we have both domestic and international uh, concerns as a, as a revolutionary party. And I think that uh, our, our efforts to try to uh, make ourselves familiar with, with China's history, China's revolutionary path, uh, become even more crucial in, in moments like these. So I uh, appreciate those of you who've been with us in the previous weeks and we'll make our way forward here uh, today. If we can bring up the slides, that would be good. Okay, and go to that first one. Well, the next one. There we go. This is what uh, in this first session today, um, I wanna try and get through. Just talk a little bit about uh, the establishment of the People's Republic of China, uh, the process of building socialism through the 1950s. And then one of the more um, uh, often uh, uh, controversial, if you will, uh, uh, moments in that process, uh, especially in, in the accounts that uh, are usually fed to us in the West, uh, the Great Leap Forward. And then uh, something that emerges out of this whole period is the question of the relationship between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, that reaches a rather dramatic uh, turning point in 1959, 1960 with the Sino-Soviet split. So we'll try to work our way through uh, that material here uh, in the first part today. Uh, and of course, uh, this may well uh, generate some interesting questions. So we'll, uh, we'll deal with those in the Q&A. All right, uh, if we can have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is where we wound up last time. We had followed the course of the revolution, beginning with the founding of the uh, Chinese Communist Party in Shanghai back in 1921. Uh, and uh, uh, through the, the, the long and somewhat circuitous route of revolutionary struggle, uh, uh, fighting both against uh, the, the reactionary nationalists and against the Japanese invaders from the late 1930s till 1945. And then finally, after the Civil War, the culmination uh, of the revolution with the proclamation by uh, Chairman Mao here in the picture um, on October 1st, 1949 of the founding uh, of the People's Republic. So if we can have the next slide. Getting the People's Republic started uh, was a, a, a monstrous task, a huge task. Uh, China had, of course, been through 30 years of, uh, of war and trauma, uh, the Japanese invasion especially, but the Civil War as well. Uh, there was a lot of uh, damage to uh, uh, just people, but to uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, industry, things like that. Uh, situations around the country were had, had been quite tumultuous for a long time. So when liberation takes place in 1949, and as the new regime is being established, um, the party and uh, the army uh, and the new government and the people faced uh, very severe challenges. And the way that they wanted to uh, move forward in that moment was to create a, a people's government that was going to... Um, uh, establish new institutions, stabilize the situation in the country, and then begin the process of revolutionary transformation and the construction of socialism. <coughs> Excuse me. And at the heart of this process was what we call people's democracy. Um, the idea that uh, the Chinese people should be the masters of their new society, should be the, the driving force in history and in the construction of the new China that there was a need to establish state institutions uh, and there was a need for political uh, leadership and guidance in that process. And one concrete form that that took initially was the convening of what's called the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is kind of a mouthful to say, but it's a very important uh, institution and it still meets. They just met uh, about a week ago again. Um, this is a broad coalition uh, of uh, political parties uh, across the political spectrum uh, and non-party people as well uh, that meets in conjunction with usually just prior to meetings of the National People's Congress uh, in order to debate and discuss the 
the uh, uh, powerful issues of the day. The, the CPPCC was involved in the process of formulating and has been involved in the process of revising the constitution of the People's Republic of China. It plays an advisory role. It makes recommendations about legislation to the National People's Congress. And it is, it's, it's a primary mechanism for involving uh, uh, the widest possible uh, uh, spectrum of people in political uh, uh, discussion and policy formulation within, uh, within the new China. Initially, uh, simply coming out of the chaos of, of revolution and civil war, uh, uh, one of the first tasks faced by the revolution was uh, stabilization. And this was done through establishing control over the, the geographic territory of China, uh, which was divided up into a set of military regions. Uh, it also involved uh, uh, particular efforts to address uh, 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 concerns in places like Shanghai, which of course was the most uh, industrially developed uh, uh, center and city in China, and one where uh, the struggles of the party had, had of course gone on over much of the previous 30 years. The island of Hainan in the far south, the last uh, territory really to be uh, liberated by the, by the Red Army, the People's Liberation Army, and the peaceful uh, extension of uh, central control over his uh, peripheral areas like Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, which had uh, uh, been under the control as, as many parts of China had, uh, both of, uh, of local uh, sort of warlord uh, forces uh, and also, of course, of representatives of the nationalists. As the nationalist uh, system collapsed and they withdrew to uh, uh, new uh, new forces of stability, new institutions needed to be put in place uh, to extend the, uh, the, the new People's Republic uh, uh, to, to all the territories which had previously been uh, a part of, of the Chinese state. In addition to these uh, sort of institutional innovations, I want to mention two policy steps that were taken uh, right away at the very, very beginning of, of the People's Republic. Um, in fact, uh, uh, the first of them uh, even begins before uh, uh, the, the actual proclamation of the new state. And these are things that we've talked about previously. We talked about last week in terms of uh, both uh, the Jiangxi Soviet and the Yan'an base area during the revolution. Um, and these are land reform and the marriage law. Uh, land reform is a process that gets started in the liberated zones, uh, uh, the, the full program of land reform in 1948, and is carried through all the way down through 1952 in the rest of China. And in some ways, land reform is the most fundamental transformation that takes place uh, because Land reform is about redistributing land. Land was the most fundamental, the most uh, basic productive resource. So to start building a modern socialist economy, the land had to be redistributed from uh, a, a, a precious commodity in the hands of a small landlord class into the hands of the vast majority of, uh, of the working people, the, the farmers, the primary producers across the country. That was a, uh, a protracted struggle. It was one in which the party played the role of, of mobilizing local uh, uh, local communities. Uh, a lot of what was called speaking bitterness, the speaking out of ordinary people about the exploitation and oppression they had suffered at the hands of the landlords. And the, uh, the, then the appropriation uh, or expropriation of, uh, of land from uh, a land who, who were allowed to gain some of their own and they kept to farm it and sustain themselves. The idea wasn't to get rid of them, but simply to, to have a more equitable distribution. And the surplus land taken from the landlords was divided up and distributed amongst the farming population, creating a base, improving agricultural productivity. And we'll come back and talk about the process of agricultural cooperativization and collectivization in just a couple minutes. The other major reform that gets started right at the beginning is the marriage law of 1950. This was the first legislative act of the new government. And this was a, 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 a fundamental component of establishing a new social order because it put an end forever to the old system of arranged marriages. 
It made marriage an agreement, a contract between two consenting parties, either of whom could, if things didn't work out, initiate divorce. So it gave women the, uh, the ability to, uh, to freely enter into marriage, but also to initiate divorce proceedings and have agency within uh, the family situation. And in tandem with land reform, the marriage law gave women property. Women, when, when land was redistributed, it wasn't just distributed to male heads of household, it was distributed to all adults within a family unit so that women came to have their own plots of land. And this gave them the economic agency to be able to become uh, fully equal partners and participants in the new society. Okay, so we'll trace some of that further as we go along as well. Next slide, please. The question of the relationship with the Soviet Union, of course, was going to be critical to the, the first phases of development for China. Uh, the Soviet Union was the center of, uh, of socialism. It was the, the country with the longest history of building socialism and obviously was going to be an important uh, uh, ally and resource for the revolutionary state uh, in China. Chairman Mao traveled to Moscow in the winter of 1949 to 50. This was the only time in his life he ever left China. But he went there and uh, negotiated, met directly with, uh, with Comrade Stalin. Uh, and uh, of course, a, a large team on both sides took part in these negotiations. And in February of 1950, the Soviet Union and China signed a treaty of friendship under the terms of which the Soviets would provide uh, all lots of assistance to China, uh, 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 direct aid loans. Although of course these were these weren't grants; these were loans, so they were uh, at interest. Um, but this also set the stage for, in the 1950s, the Soviet Union to serve as a developmental model, and I say a developmental model, not the developmental model, uh, for China as it embarked upon its efforts to create uh, a new order. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, the Korean War breaks out in June of 1950, not even a year after the proclamation of the People's Republic. Uh, uh, China, of course, had long historical links with Korea. Uh, the United States had occupied the southern part of the Korean Peninsula after the end of World War II uh, and had overseen the establishment of a puppet government there under the leadership of uh, uh, Syngman Rhee, a, a Presbyterian minister from the United States who hadn't lived in Korea since 1896. Um, and uh, uh, the northern part of uh, Korea had been uh, occupied by the Soviets, uh, who had helped the, the local uh, anti-Japanese resistance fighters led by Kim Il-sung establish a, a revolutionary socialist state uh, in the north. Uh, tensions between the North and the South, of course, uh, were, were intense. And uh, uh, in uh, the summer of 1950, uh, both sides anticipated that there might be uh, further conflict. Uh, and finally, in June, forces from the Democratic Republic in the North uh, moved preemptively to try to thwart attacks from the Southern uh, uh, sector. Uh, against uh, against uh, uh, people in the north, um, the United States, of course, was the real actor here. It was uh, American imperialism trying to consolidate its position in the Western Pacific and in East Asia. Um, that uh, that then sent massive forces into Korea. Uh, they pushed uh, the the uh, forces of the north uh, all the way up, uh, basically, to the border with China. Now, China, uh, of course, was trying to trying to get its new government going, trying to start its its process of socialist development. Was hardly interested in going to war, but uh, the threat of American imperialism and the historic bonds of friendship with the Korean people meant that the Chinese, at great sacrifice to themselves, in November of 1950, sent 600,000 volunteers across the border into Korea. Uh, and they managed to uh, help the, uh, the Korean people in, in resisting uh, the Americans and pushed the line of, uh, of, uh, of combat back down to the central part of the peninsula. That war, of course, uh, halts or is suspended in 1953. 
and the situation on the Korean Peninsula remains one of division and uh, and uh, instability uh, ever since. Uh, uh, There's a whole set of issues that, that we can address uh, at some other time. Uh, but the Korean War, what's important for our narrative is that the Korean War is a is a huge sacrifice. It diverts resources. Uh, not just material resources, of course, but human resources. Many Chinese fighters are killed, including one of Chairman Mao's sons uh, in the fighting in uh, Korea. Um, and this is right at the time when the Chinese were, were struggling so hard to start the process of building their own uh, socialist state. Okay, next slide, please. One of the things that uh, uh, we'll be hearing more about uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, especially two weeks from now, uh, will be um, trouble in, in, in global affairs. And one thing that, uh, that we want to emphasize and make clear here is how consistent China has been uh, in its attitude towards international relations. The, the, the idea somehow that China is an expansionist sort of neo-imperialist or neo Colonial history, we hear this bantered about by, by bourgeois politicians and media, um, is, is, is simply not uh, uh, grounded in, in, in truth or fact. And we can see this going all the way back to the 1950s, begins to emerge uh, on the global stage. Of course, China was initially excluded from the United Nations uh, uh, by the United States uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, vetoed or, or, or pressured other countries uh, not to allow China to take its proper seat. Uh, the, the nationalist regime on Taiwan was seated in the UN. Um, but China began to play a, a very responsible role in global affairs right away. Uh, 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 Zhou Enlai, uh, who had, uh, you know, uh, been part of the founding of the party in France back in 1921 and had uh, uh, been uh, basically uh, Chairman Mao's right-hand man, was prime minister and also foreign minister. Um, China took part in the Geneva Peace Conferences uh, to end the war, the French war in, uh, in Vietnam and in Indochina, uh, and, and basically uh, became uh, the, the, the face of China on the international stage. Very famously, when the American Secretary of State uh, met Zhou Enlai in Geneva, he refused to shake Zhou Enlai's hand uh, this became uh, symbolic of the hostility uh, that the United States directed towards the new China. But in 1955, China played a critical role in the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, which was the first convening of what was called the non-aligned movement, countries that wished not to be identified either with uh, uh, the Soviet Union nor with the United States, but wanted to chart an independent role as developing newly uh, autonomous countries in the world. And China lent its support to countries from Indonesia to Egypt to uh, to India, uh, the, the, the post-colonial societies that were emerging on the global stage at that point. China's position on international affairs has always emphasized respect for sovereignty, non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, uh, and those continue to be guiding principles for China today. So I just wanted to, to take note that that was something that was foundational to, uh, to the People's Republic. Next slide, please. The process of building socialism advances on a number of, uh, of fronts. In, uh, in the early 1950s, only about 20, maybe a little more than 20% of Chinese people lived in cities, but nonetheless, the cities were the center of modern development, the centers of industry, the centers of banking and finance, the centers of the commercial economy. <clears throat> and gaining control over the cities and stabilizing the urban economy was a top priority for the, for the party and the government uh, in these early years, getting inflation under control, reining in many of the social abuses, uh, uh, the widespread problems still with opium, the legacy of, of British imperialism all the way back in the 19th century, uh, prostitution, gambling, other kinds of, um, of social problems. Um, as well as uh, economic corruption and profiteering, uh, the manipulation of markets, the hoarding of goods, uh, uh, the, uh, especially things like medical supplies, um, 
these things all had to be brought under control. All of these problems had flourished during the, uh, the revolutionary period, during the struggle to gain power. Now the new government set about cleaning up uh, and reforming uh, the cities, so both public administration, but also uh, the, con the conduct of, of business and the operation of, of, uh, of public life. Um, and this was done in a way that was designed to, to build as much support for the new government as possible. Um, for example, in, in dealing with prostitution, it wasn't just a matter of rounding people up and putting them in jail, but of creating vocational training programs, finding people jobs, creating opportunities for people to, to live meaningful lives um, without having to resort to, uh, uh, you know, to, to modes of, of existence that were, that were more problematic for them. The same was true with, with drug addiction. It wasn't, they weren't rounding up people and, and putting them in prison forever, uh, but instead trying to provide ways that people could, uh, could, could build their lives while the country was building its new, uh, its new order. Next, please. One of the big challenges faced by the party, faced by the new uh, uh, situation, was uh, administration. Um, in 1949, when the, when the Chinese Communist Party uh, comes to power, there were perhaps a million members, most of them drawn from rural China. Many were illiterate, and most of them had very little administrative experience. They were revolutionary fighters who had, uh, who had uh, you know, built the revolution, who had managed and administered uh, the territories controlled by the party. Uh, but uh, in terms of now suddenly having the responsibility for managing uh, and administering uh, a country the size of China that had 450 million people, uh, these were huge challenges. So the party needed to grow, the party needed to expand its ranks. And it did this very, very rapidly. By 1956, there were already over 10 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. Many people were brought into the party because they had administrative experience, financial experience, business experience that was needed to help manage the affairs of the economy and the government uh, in, this, uh, in this transitional period. But that brought with it um, certain challenges, certain problems. Many people uh, joined the party, not so much necessarily out of sincere, um, sincere uh, uh, ideological motivation or sincere commitment to the vision of, of building the socialist China, but um, uh, sort of in, a, in what we might think of as a careerist way or an opportunist way, uh, seeing the new government, the new uh, uh, growth of the party as a way uh, to position themselves advantageously. Not that, not that everyone who joined the party was, was cynical or, or careerist at all. Many, many, many people came into the party who were sincerely devoted to the creation of the new China. But this did yield certain trends within the party towards bureaucratization, towards people who took their positions within the party as positions of power, as positions of influence, and um, perhaps were not as, uh, as deeply committed to immersing themselves in the needs and interests of the people uh, as they might have been. This was just a... Um, a tension, a contradiction within the party uh, that, that began to be of concern, began to be uh, uh, manifesting itself uh, in the course of the 1950s. Next slide, please. At the heart of the process of building socialism in China is the question of agricultural collectivization. And the reason for this is bound up with, with what Marx calls the process of, of primitive or primary accumulation. To build a modern industrial socialist economy, there had to be resources for investment, what in a capitalist society we would just call capital. Um, accumulated value, accumulated wealth, which would be available to invest in the building of factories and railroads and port facilities and highways and all the things, buying the machinery that would be necessary to build uh, a, 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 a modern industrial economy. Well, where were you going to get those resources? How were you going to generate surplus, surplus of value uh, that could be directed towards this kind of in investment. 
The only, the, the primary productive resource was the land and the primary economic activity was farming, was agricultural production. So land reform broke up the old system under which a handful of landlords that sat on top of society extracted value from the labor of the masses. And it put that resource into the hands of the masses. And then through the 50s, the party guided a process first of cooperativization and then of collectivization of agriculture to yield greater and greater enhancements of productivity. Basically, when people worked together, when they pooled their assets and their resources, when they made land, they, they converted land from tiny little strips of individual farmers into larger fields that could be uh, uh, sown and tilled and harvested collectively, that yielded great benefits, great expansions in agricultural productivity. But this was a, a careful and cautious process. It was a very bottom-up process. It started in the first couple of years with what were called mutual aid teams, where within a particular village, a group of households might get together and help each other out. That yielded better harvests. That yielded better income for those households. So then they moved to what were called agricultural producers cooperatives. And that went on in a couple of phases, a lower level and a higher level, where the number of people involved got bigger. It might expand to include a whole village or even a cluster of villages who would share their resources. If one household had a, had a donkey and another household had an ox and one household had a particularly good set of tools or something, those could be shared and, and, and the, the benefits of, of those assets would be, uh, would be cooperatively uh, uh, productive for, for all the participants in that, in that movement. And finally, the, the highest stage of this begins to emerge uh, in 1957 and 1958 with the first establishment of people's communes. And this becomes a real critical moment. The communes grew to be pretty good size. Some encompassed not just, not just multiple villages, multiple clusters of villages. What, what today would be, or what in, in, in America we would think of, of units almost on the size of like a county. Think of a, of a rural county in Kansas or, or, uh, or South Dakota. Um, a commune came to be the, the largest unit of collective agricultural production. Okay, and eventually there were about 75,000 communes spread across China that were um, trying to, uh, to move forward with, with greater and greater levels of economies of scale and enhanced agricultural productivity. The poster here, the, the, the saying at the bottom there, this is a quote from Chairman Mao, it just says, Renmin Gong Shi Hao, people's communes are good. This was a line that the chairman said during an inspection visit uh, in the fall of 1957 that uh, got, got picked up and, and, uh, and triggered a wave of enthusiasm uh, that led to the creation of many, many more communes in the course of the following year, 1958. If we can have the next slide. That takes us to what comes to be known as the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward is the ultimate expression, in a sense, of one vision of how to develop socialism in China, how to create the new China through the mobilization of mass enthusiasm, through the mobilization of the masses. This is one line uh, of what comes to be a two-line struggle, really, a conflict between two developmental perspectives. This is the line that we associate with Chairman Mao and the people who agreed with him. Um, the idea was that, that, that China had great productive potential, great productive capacity, and by mobilizing the masses, by getting people to, to understand this and to work together and to cooperate, great things could be achieved. And the the poster here, the image here, is this vision of, of what the future could be like. I don't want to go into too much detail of what's there, but it's got everything from, from fields of grain to, uh, to uh, brick kilns to little uh, factories, 
fish ponds, uh, cooperative uh, 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 kitchens and, and, and dining areas, all this kind of stuff. It was a vision of a society in which um, the commune would be the basic social unit. And within the commune, 100,000 people would share in the tasks of production and would share in the fruits of their communal labor, okay? The Great Leap Forward runs into trouble. Um, and it ran into trouble uh, on, a, on, a, on a couple of bases. Um, but primarily the problem was that um, many of those people who had come into the party in the course of the 1950s um, were, uh, as I said, uh, perhaps a little careerist, a little opportunist in their consciousness. And when they understood the, the idea of the mass campaign and, and the goals, the ambitious goals of ramping up production and achieving new higher levels, um, there was a little bit of a tendency to fudge things, to exaggerate reports of productivity. Um, not to, not to you know, say, oh, well, we, have, we, we, we got 10,000 bushels of grain, I'm gonna say we got 20,000. But to say, well, we got 10,000 bushels of grain, I'm gonna say we got 10,500. Doesn't that sound a little better? But unfortunately, as that process went up the hierarchy, a little bit of padding, a little bit of exaggeration, you wound up with figures of production that were unrealistic. And that led to problems of too much grain being procured from the countryside, not enough being left over to feed the local people and to have grain for the next year's uh, planting. and you had food shortages and widespread hunger. And it's simply a, a reality that a lot of people died, uh, a, a few million people died as a result of mismanagement during this period. The Great Leap Forward is a, is a very problematic period, not caused by you know, some insane vision uh, or some uh, homicidal fantasy of, uh, of uh, Chairman Mao and the leadership, but caused by bureaucratic distortion of the tasks of organization and management of production. And this is a, uh, this is a, a very, very challenging episode uh, that, uh, that of course is routinely demonized in, in, in Western bourgeois media and, and academia. Uh, but it's a, it's a very uh, problematic uh, uh, moment um, that, uh, that you know, we need to understand uh, in, in our own perspective. Give me the next slide. In the midst of this, in the summer of 1959, the party convenes a meeting um, at a place called Lushan, which is down in central China. Um, and at that meeting, uh, the issues of the Great Leap Forward were thrashed out. Uh, Peng Dehuai, who's in the picture here on the left, he was the Minister of Defense, um, had been a hero in the Korean War, was a, a very well-respected leader. Um, but he, he he criticized Chairman Mao. He, he argued that the, the policies of mass mobilization that the chairman endorsed um, had led to the problems of the Great Leap Forward, rather than uh, the idea that, uh, that, that uh, self-interested bureaucrats had distorted information that led to bad, uh, bad outcomes, bad planning and bad implementation. Um, and the problem, the real problem wasn't that he made this criticism, but that he made it behind the chairman's back. He tried to undermine the chairman. He circulated a secret letter amongst the party leaders. Um, when Mao learned about this, he confronted Peng openly. And the result of this was two outcomes. One was that Peng Dehuai resigned as Minister of Defense. He was reassigned to be in charge of industrial development in the Southwest in, in, in Sichuan, Yunnan, places like that. But the chairman accepted some of these criticisms. He acknowledged that, um, you know, maybe oversight from the top of the sort of middle levels of the party had not been as rigorous as it should have been. And he agreed to step back. He, he stepped down as a um, uh, uh, President of the People's Republic, replaced by Liu Shaoqi, and he uh, he agreed to to devote his uh, work to sort of big picture big picture questions, and not so much the day to day administration of party affairs and government affairs. So this is a very important moment where the chairman steps back from direct 
uh, oversight of, uh, of policy and, and daily administration. Next slide, last slide for my part today. Okay, in this moment, when China's facing very, very difficult times, these tensions that had been there already between Mao and Stalin, even with the 1950 Treaty of Friendship, the Soviets had provided aid in the 50s, but there, come, there came to be fundamental disagreements about the proper model of development that China should follow. And this reflected the divisions within China itself, what we call the struggle between two lines. One of which I've, I've articulated this vision of mass mobilization, of the enthusiasm of the people, of building from the bottom up a new socialist economy. But that was in contrast to the Soviet model and to a view that was shared by, by many comrades in China itself within the Chinese party, people like Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, which was a more top down, rely on the experts, rely upon the leadership of the party um, and have the masses sort of be um, managed and guided and directed, but not be the source, not be the driving force of development, okay? These different developmental models, both, I mean, everybody on, on both sides of the struggle, they were committed to building socialism in China, but there were fundamental differences of perspective on how best to go about that. The Soviet leadership, even after the death of Stalin, even under Khrushchev, came increasingly to see Chairman Mao and the mobilization, uh, uh, mass mobilization uh, uh, orientation as what they called adventurist, um, not, uh, uh, not the proper way to go about uh, developing China. And so in August of 59, right when the Lushan plenum was going on, right when the party was trying to come to grips with the challenges of the Great Leap Forward, the Soviets pulled out. They cut off all their aid. They began to call in the loans that they had extended. They put extra pressure on China to try to force a change uh, in direction, okay? So by the time we're up to 1960, the beginning of the 1960s, China has had a decade of development. They've achieved great things. There's no question that, that industrial development is getting started based upon agricultural cooperativization and collectivization. Material standards of living have risen dramatically. Uh, uh, you know, uh, life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, all of these indicators have improved dramatically. Even the problems of the Great Leap uh, were, were not to minimize them, not to discount them, but they were, they were problems that, that needed to be managed, needed to be corrected, needed to be overcome. But there was still uh, so much that had been achieved and so much that had been gained. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we move into the next phase, we move into the 1960s, not on the basis of a China that was somehow um, struggling just to hang on, but, but with a very solid base of development already in place from this first decade, okay? I'll be happy to uh, move into the Q&A for this part, and then we'll hear from Comrade Sheila about uh, further developments on down the line, okay? All right, thank you so much for the presentation, Ken. Uh, so we do have some time for Q&A at this time, uh, just about 15 minutes. I do have some questions here um, that we pull from the chat um, and uh, both Sheila and Ken, feel free to jump in however you would like. I'll, I'll just start with about two questions. Is that okay? Sure. All right, so... Um, the first few questions I have here are in relation to uh, the communes and the cooperatives. Uh -huh. uh, so the first one is, what is the difference between a cooperative and a collective enterprise? And then uh, just to go off of that, um, did the people's communes come from a longer history of experience of the Chinese people in the Communist Party? Uh, and uh, so they weren't just an idea someone had after the revolution that just got implemented. Is that correct? Right, right. Um, well, let me, let me take that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the idea of, of the commune uh, uh, and this whole process of agricultural uh, uh, cooperativization, um, 
you know, they had the experience, they had the historical, historical experience of the Soviet Union to, to look at, because of course, when, when the Bolshevik revolution takes place, when the Soviets begin trying to build uh, a modern economy there, um, they faced, uh, they had many of the same circumstances. They had a, a, a national economy uh, that was overwhelmingly agrarian um, and which uh, they understood that, that the base for building a modern industrial economy was going to be the accumulation of surplus from the agricultural sector. Now in the Soviet Union, uh, that process of cooperativization and collectivization unfortunately was handled in a, in a rather commandist top-down fashion that, that generated a lot of, uh, of resistance and opposition and, and, and didn't, didn't go as well, uh, shall we say, as, uh, as it might have. In China, because of the party's commitment to the peasants, to the farmers, as the base of the revolution, as the core of the revolution, um, they, you know, uh, there was already massive support in the countryside uh, amongst the farming population. So the process of cooperativization um, went forward not, not by command, not by fiat from leaders in Beijing, but on the ground across the country with the guidance and the leadership of the party, but, but in a very uh, participatory and bottom up kind of way. And, and uh, on, the, on the reading list that we've put together for this, uh, uh, Bill Hinton's book, Fan Shen, uh, is an account of, of land reform and agricultural reform uh, in China during this period. It's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great source for taking a look at, at, at this process, a narrative of this process. Um, so, so they built these models kind of as they went. They had the, the, the vision of, of cooperative farms, collective farms from the Soviet Union. And of course, just, just the idea of, of cooperation and, and, and collective production had, had roots going back into various forms of socialist experiments in, 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 the, in, the, in the earlier 20th and 19th century and like that. Um, in terms of the first question that this process of cooperativization, collectivization and all that, a cooperative in, in the cooperatives, individual households continued to retain sort of legal ownership uh, over their particular plots of land. They would cooperate with other households in the farming and sharing the tasks and sharing the assets and the resources, the machinery, the equipment, whatever. But legally these were individual households working together. Collectivization involved the, the surrender of the formal title to the land to the collective. Uh, and, and then as that scaled up, the collectives uh, did the same thing. They pooled land uh, in the communes. Uh, and some of this was in a sense, you can almost think of it as a, as a form of accounting to keep track of who is contributing. Remember that, that the fundamental principle of socialism is from each according to their ability to each according to their work, according to their labor. So the mechanism here was to keep track of who was working, who was doing what, who was uh, you know, uh, plowing the field, who was harvesting the corn, who was managing the fish pond, what labor was being put in. And then when, when the harvest came in, when, when, when the profits were toted up at the end of the accounting cycle, assets, resources, value would be distributed on the basis of, of what were called labor points, who had contributed what, with of course a social fund for people who couldn't work for one reason or another. Um, but that was done on a basis of collective ownership. So the difference between the cooperative period and the collective period is a difference between private ownership and cooperation and collective ownership and communal distribution. Okay, other questions? Great, thank you. And then um, the next set of questions I have here are uh, in relation to the Great Leap Forward. Uh, so the first one I have here is, how can we compare the Great Leap Forward in China to the NED and uh, collectivization period in the USSR? Uh, what lessons could other nations learn during their early stages of, of socialist development? Um, and then another question I have here is, 
Were there any other factors contributing to the famine uh, during the Great Leap Forward? And in general, was there a desire um, by the Communist Party um, to end the division between rural and urban cities? Like, was that really a goal? Did they manage to achieve any success in this? Yeah, boy, there's a lot, that's a lot packed in there. Um, the contrast between the Soviet and, and Chinese experiences uh, is, is fundamental. Uh, and I, I just talked about that a little bit in terms of, of the process of, of uh, collectivization. Um, I think, I think that in dealing with the Great Leap, uh, I mean, and, and first of all, just on, on just on a very simple factual basis, there were also additional factors. For one thing, um, weather. Uh, 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 the 50s was a period of particularly good weather in China. They had a, 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 the harvests that increased from 52 to 58. Uh, every year there were there were greater and greater yields, uh, higher and higher levels of grain production. Um, uh, that was also during a period where, where the weather was pretty good. Um, the winter of 1958 to 59 was bad, uh, uh, bad in terms of rain, bad in terms of, uh, of temperatures, uh, and uh, uh, a fair bit of grain was lost uh, because of that um, as well. So, so yeah, there were multiple factors. Not It wasn't just bureaucratic mismanagement, but it was also, there were also factors of um, of, uh, of uh, weather. And of course, the withdrawal of Soviet assistance in the summer of 59 meant that the process of recovering from the shortfalls of the winter of 58 to 59 was, was undermined, was, uh, uh, you know, that, that made things worse and it took longer to get things back on track uh, after, uh, after the Soviets withdrew. So yeah, there, there were multiple factors. But I I just think that that as as historical materialists and and and, and clear-eyed comrades, we do have to acknowledge that that, that, that mistakes were made, right? Uh, um, and I, and I guess that in terms of thinking about what lessons might be drawn from the Chinese experience for other uh, aspiring socialist uh, uh, development developers, um, the main thing is 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 to make sure that 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 supervision. Uh, over uh, administration by the masses is maintained. You know, uh, uh, the, the problems weren't in the fields. The problems weren't uh, with, with, with people's work and people's labor and people's productivity. The problems were in administration, statistical distortion, and, and calculations. The plan for the, for the summer of 1959 was based on bad stats from the fall of 1950 which meant that procurement levels were too high. That was the principal cause of the food shortages in the countryside. Those things need to be public, not, not carried on within a, a sort of uh, discretionary reporting system. You know? So I think that, that mass supervision is probably the most important message or lesson to be drawn, uh, the, the necessity of that out of, out of the problems of, uh, of the Great Leap. I think that addressed those questions. Yes, absolutely. And then the final kind of set of questions I have here are in relationship to uh, the Sino-Soviet split. So in discussion of the Sino-Soviet split, we often hear about the influence of the United States. Can you go into this and discuss how it influenced the Sino-Soviet relationship? And then um, another question um, is, could you please clarify why the USSR withdrew aid from China in an attempt to influence Chinese policy? Sure. Um, well, the Soviet leaders uh, thought that, that the direction that, uh, that Chairman Mao and his supporters were taking uh, was wrong, was bad. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it was just an effort to, uh, to, to, to put some pressure on. Um, there's a, there's a, 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 an amazing exchange of letters between the central committees of the Chinese and Soviet parties that, that goes on in 1961, 1962, 1963, um, which are published there. You can find them uh, in English. Um, in which uh, they, the, the, the two sides criticize each other they, about their, their policies, about their, uh, their, uh, their practices, you know. Um, this is a, it's a, 
it's a disagreement. It's a it's a, a fraternal polemic. It's sometimes characterized as uh, between these between the two parties between the two states uh, as to how best to go forward. But it, it was a real struggle. I mean, uh, uh, the, the the stakes were huge uh, uh, for everybody. So uh, the Soviet withdrawal of aid uh, was uh, you know it was it was a tactical move to try to put pressure on the Chinese to say oh we better we better change our our our. Our position. We better change what we're doing. It didn't have that effect. If anything, it it it, it made uh, it intensified the conflict uh, within China. But you know that, that's that's another that's another set of issues. Um, as far as the American, uh, the question of the Americans. I mean, the, the one of the things that's that's involved. It wasn't just issues over over development models. Um, the question was. What's the nature of, of uh, global revolutionary uh, politics? And, and again, the Chinese saw the Soviets as being kind of too accommodating uh, with the Americans. Uh, uh, the idea of peaceful uh, coexistence that Khrushchev had articulated, um, the idea that, I mean, Khrushchev's idea, the idea behind peaceful coexistence was that the superiority of the Soviet socialist system would demonstrate itself, and that uh, in the context of nuclear weapons, uh, it was better to not risk global warfare and nuclear destruction, but to allow the, the two systems to compete with one another. So when, when the, the slogan of peaceful coexistence, it's not just coexistence, it's also competition. And, and Khrushchev believed that this, the superiority of Soviet socialism would be demonstrated um, as, uh, as, as you know, development went forward and, and the, the conditions of life for the Soviet people uh, continued to improve. And, and in fact, you know, in the, in the 50s, the Soviets were making tremendous strides. Material standards were rising there as well. Um, so that was, what, that was what the Soviets were, were trying to do. But Chairman Mao and, 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 and the Chinese in general saw the Soviets as too accommodating, as kind of betraying the revolutionary struggle on a global basis to American imperialism. Okay, uh, And so they, they criticized the Soviets on that basis. And it's not to say, you know, one side was right and one side was wrong, but those were the, those were the distinct positions that, that, the, that the different parties uh, took. So as far as, as the Americans, I mean, it isn't, the Americans actually didn't believe in the Sino-Soviet split when it first began to become public. They thought that this was some sort of a ploy that the, that the commies were carrying out to deceive uh, American policymakers. They had so little understanding of the realities of Chinese history and of Russian history and all that, that uh, for a while, 59, 60, 61, they didn't even take it seriously. Uh, it took a while for, for policy analysts, in, 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 even in like the CIA, to, to realize that this really was a substantial difference of opinion that was gonna have serious policy consequences for these two countries. So it's not like the Americans were being clever and manipulating this, but it was rather Soviet attitudes towards the Americans that came in for criticism from the Chinese. Okay. Any more questions? Of course, you can you can uh, you can put those in by chat. You can put them on the on the uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, we'll try to uh, to respond to those and aggregate both questions and responses and make those available uh, going forward. But I'll turn it over to Comrade Sheila for the next part. You can go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, like Ken said, uh, we will post uh, the responses to the unanswered questions on uh, liberationschool.org, so you can check those out over there. Thank you, Ken. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, now, Sheila will be presenting the second lecture on the socialist education movement, the great proletarian cultural revolution, the Ninth Party Congress, the passing of an era in 1976, and uh, Deng Xiaoping. So Sheila, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for um, your part, Ken. That was very, very informative. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions for the second half. Can we move to the next slide? 
Okay, so now, you know, we've heard a little bit about how China begins to tackle the question of development after revolution, right? We learn about the gains and also the challenges of the Great Leap Forward. And while, you know, there were many failures, there were also many, many gains that are often ignored by the mainstream, um, at least in mainstream accounts of the Great Leap Forward, as Ken pointed out earlier. Um, the Great Leap Forward, you know, mobilized masses of people to carry out major infrastructural projects that really lay the basis for future industrial development. And much of the lessons learned from this period sharpen the debates around economic policy that lead up to the Cultural Revolution. So um, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so here we have the socialist education movement, right? And this is sort of the precursor to the Cultural Revolution. So at this time, Mao had already stepped down as the head of state um, and by him stepping down was really an, an acknowledgement of the issues that the party made in the prior years that we discussed, right? So the socialist education movement that was launched um, as a response to the idea that there was so much bureaucratic covering of party officials that was deflecting the damage and failures of the previous years to protect themselves, right? Um, and many party cadre were instead blaming the failures on like intellectuals, reactionaries, instead of actually accepting responsibility for these errors. And in the process of kind of fixing the damage to the economy from the Great Leap Forward era, era, era um, the Great Leap Forward era, political uh, considerations were somewhat marginalized, right? Decisions about development started to veer towards Western and Soviet models, towards an abandonment of uh, revolutionary idea, like ideals. And this is what Mao and his supporters later call the capitalist road. Um, again, right in the 50s, the process of development was really an era of mass mobilization, right? The difficulties and the Great Leap Forward really resulted in a de-emphasis of this mass mobilization model and, a, and the emergence of a directive approach by these kind of middle level party cadre that we saw in the countryside. The communes still existed there, but now the party committees are just running administratively um, rather than as organizations of mass mobilization. So in 1962, Mao calls for the socialist education movement where a nationwide investigation of the countryside um, begins and, and he begins to send people from the party, so party cadres, students, peasants, and intellectuals to see what the conditions in the villages are really like. And this was an attempt by Mao to get the local party officials to uh, listen to the people, listen to the masses, right? Instead of just administrating. Um, the cadres in the party um, take this movement um, in a way and turn it into an instrument uh, to control the masses instead of listening to the masses. And, um, you know, this very this very much frustrates Mao, right? Uh, this reassertion of some sort of a, a mass mobilization model that Mao attempts gets, you know, thwarted and then eventually it leads to the Cultural Revolution. But a part of what came out of the socialist education movement was that many of the youth um, that were from the urban centers who went to the countryside um, were actually dealt with kind of a really significant awakening, right? Uh, there was, you know, they realized that there was a huge, huge um, gap in development in the countryside, right? And this begins to um, stir up the consciousness among um, students um, among the urban youth, right? For the first time, um, they really saw that the uh, the continuing of the revolutionary process, right? They kind of um, had this idealized sense of what revolution looked like because they were in the urban centers, right? The urban centers were developing fine, they were progressing, but it wasn't so much the same in the countryside, right? There was still a lot of poverty, a lot of gaps, and so. Um, yeah, this, this, uh, they realized that this revolution was still a work in progress. Next slide. Okay, so now we get into the great proletarian cultural revolution, which is um, just like the Great Leap Forward, this is something that you could, you know, just teach a whole class on just the cultural revolution, but we, we don't have 
time for that. So I'm going to try to explain it as briefly as possible. Um, but many people who know about the great proletarian cultural revolution have the understanding that it was like this overzealous anti-intellectual movement. Um, but we'll get into explaining what the, the uh, cultural revolution you know, actually was and, and what resulted in that. So again, Mao continues waging struggle within the party to rid the bureaucratic elements, the opportunist elements from the party. Um, this really emerges when the clear factions within the party um, had debates over the best method to develop China while also, um, you know, and meeting the needs of the people while also building a socialist society. So Ken earlier talked about the, the one side of the two line struggle, which was mass mobilization. Um, and this is really the cultural revolution really struggles with the two lines, right? And so the core of the um, cultural revolution was this divergence in leadership with the party about the central question, how do we best develop China, right? Members of the party who represented the two lines were both united I wanted to emphasize that they were still united on, on building a socialist China, but the question was how, how are, how are we actually gonna meet the material needs of the people? So on the one side, and I'll just kind of emphasize it and elaborate a little more is Mao, right? Uh, his faction believed in the power of mass mobilization. When the masses grasp the idea, it becomes a material force. And by mobilizing the enthusiasm of the masses, we could build development rather than relying on foreign development like uh, the way the USSR did. And Mao felt that ultimately the way we build the economy will shape the political nature of the system, right? Uh, it, the emphasis was on cooper cooperation, um, you know, building a proletariat, pro proletarianization, um, and this all must precede mechanization. And for Mao, the question of which will win out socialism or capitalism is still not really settled, right? It was possible for revolution to change direction, even to reserve, uh, reverse itself and turn back along the road to capitalism. This was kind of the fear, right? Uh, the only check against this that Mao believed was to re rely on the revolutionary wisdom of the masses um, to keep the party accountable. What measures can be taken to restrain class differences that were still, uh, you know, remnants of the old society uh, to fend off, right, and prevent a new capitalist state itself. How do we develop economically and mend the contradictions that come with it? Mao and his faction correctly believed that China still had to undergo a sort of a cultural revolution. The customs of the Chinese society, just like any um, society, those norms existed for thousands of years, right? So what efforts are going to be taken to shatter those norms? So Mao and his faction came to the conclusion that Chinese society still had these remnants of the same class order, class hierarchy, um, that ultimately was vulnerable to swinging back away from the revolution. So the second part of the two-line struggle, which is led by Li Xiaoqi, um, uh, the way to build the economy on this side of the faction is to rely on the expertise, leadership, uh, to guide the process, to direct the masses. Both camps were oriented towards building a socialist China, but Liu argued that mechanization should proceed with cooperation, right? He represented a strong sentiment within the party, the government bureaucracy, and the emerging technocrats, best summarized in his statement that in China, the question of which wins out, socialism or capitalism, is already solved. The revolution had already been won. Now the task was simply to proceed with economic development. There's no reason not to adopt the Western or at least the Soviet model with their emphasis on technology and specialization so long as the party guided it. So these are kind of the two lines. Next slide. So how does the, the cultural revolution really begin, right? So it, it begins with a debate over this play called High Rui Dismissed from Office. And this play was about a righteous official who spoke out against uh, the emperor. And, you know, people viewed this as an allegory of contemporary politics, and this really sparked a, a, an intense debate. So in November of 1965, Yao Wenyuan, uh, who's one of the leaders of the cultural revolution, 
wrote an article criticizing the play for its political elements, right? Ultimately, that it was an allegory criticizing the left-wing faction of the party led by Mao. And the essay was the first, you know, seen as the first shot against what was labeled as the capitalist rotor within um, the Communist Party. And this led to broader debates about how do we relate to cultural things like um, such as such as this play, right? Do we glorify these imperialist officials? Do we want to use this veiled attack to undermine leadership of the party? It starts again with uh, a debate with this play, right? So the party bureaucracy tries everything it can um, at this time uh, from discussing contemporary politics, as we talked about earlier in the socialist education movement. But in a way, the discourse um, that emerged out of this was, was really necessary in the eyes of Mao, right? It was necessary to recalibrate the revolutionary elements within the party, but constantly reconnecting with the people. The party should stay as an organ of the people's will and not have the people just be an instrument of the party. The Cultural Revolution is really a movement that calls upon the masses to criticize and supervise the work of the party. Um, it's a mass movement, right? The party needs to serve the people. It needs to be the instrument of the revolution and the party needs to submit itself to popular review. Um, this is kind of the essence of Mao's basic intention of the Cultural Revolution. So in 1966, May of 1966, the formation of the Cultural Revolution groups, um, you know, came out of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, which really was the group that would give guidance to the Cultural Revolution. And then the May 16th circular was a document written to the Central Committee um, on the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. And this becomes a document uh, that criticizes the party and the leadership and would become the explanation for the Cultural Revolution, right? It, it criticizes the party of bourgeois elements and so forth. Um, because Mao and his supporters are pushing for the Cultural Revolution, right? He's calling for students and young people to criticize bureaucratization of the party, um, you know, to weed out opportunists and so forth. Um, of course, party officials didn't like that. They didn't want that, right? Um, so when turmoil begins to emerge on these different campuses led by students, um, the party officials basically see these um, as disruptive. And so they create these work teams to be sent out to these schools as kind of an excuse to, to quell and, and calm things down and reassert party leadership. But once again, just like what happened with the socialist education movement, Mao gets frustrated by the party's response um, to this, uh, trying to control the masses rather than actually listening to, uh, to what they had to say. Um, Mao accused them of undermining the student movement. And this is when Mao puts up what is known as the Daji Bao, which I'll explain a little bit later. But the work teams are, are basically the last effort of the cadre of the party to slow down or blunt the thrust of the cultural revolution. Mao tries to get the party to listen to the masses, but essentially through the Dazi Bao, um, he unleashes the masses to go buck wild and, and boldly criticize the party leadership. Um, and so what, what is the Dazi Bao, right? It's basically, it translates to um, big character po posters. They're handwritten posters that are publicly denouncing government officials, they become a tool of propaganda and political communication through the Cultural Revolution, um, throughout the Cultural Revolution. And Mao's poster, um, his Daji Bao, basically says bombard the headquarters, right? Mao is at this point outright calling on the masses to bombard the headquarters. And this was, you know, him denouncing very boldly uh, what he called the capitalist rotors and the, and the opportunist elements within the party, right? And when we talk about the Cultural Revolution, it can sort of be summarized by this, this quote, right? Marxism comprises many principles, but in the final analysis, they can, be, they can all be brought back to a single sentence. It is a right to rebel. And this is the first time in history where a political leader calls on his own people to rebel against their rulers. In fact, call against them to re rebel against his own party, himself as a leader. 
Um, he's calling on the masses to rebel against their authorities, politicians, teachers, to boldly and directly purge um, reactionary remnants of, of, of Chinese society. As Mao very famously says, right, a revolution is not a dinner party. Um, and so when we talk about the errors and excesses and instances of violence um, that come out of the Cultural Revolution, we should imagine just for a second what would happen if a Cultural Revolution happened in our society, right? Could we imagine what it would be like if Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi or, or whatever US government official said, bombard the headquarters, right? We've literally just seen a week long uprising against brutal police killings in the United States and around and not just in the in the US, but around the world, right? Imagine if our government officials today message to the people that we have a right to rebel, right? We have a right to demand an end to brutal police killings. We have a right to resist without mass repression, right? When you think about this concept, it's actually quite truly revolutionary uh, what Mao is calling for, um, except we know that this would not happen in the United States. But just to contextualize what this what this was, right? Um, and a main part of the Cultural Revolution was also sending folks into the countryside, right? Through these re-education camps and learning learning from the masses through doing physical labor. Um, and again, to contextualize this, right? How many of us have had experiences with bosses at work who we know wouldn't last a day doing any of the work that we, the workers do, right? What would happen if one day um, they were forced to do manual labor on the fields alongside of their workers? You know, what would happen if your most racist or condescending professors are then publicly ridiculed by you and your classmates and lose their position of power, right? So this is what we mean by contextualizing what really the cultural revolution meant when Mao says bombard the headquarters. So um, by June or July 1966, people begin to uh, utilize the, um, the big character posters, um, you know, and, and for the first time in, in China's history, all of the people are integrated into the cultural and artistic side of the nation, right? It's not just about criticizing officials, but it's also changing culture, right? Um, in, in, um, historically, culture and artistic life in China was really reserved for a tiny elite. So now during the Cultural Revolution, right, culture was the means by which the emphasis of collective creativity, cooper cooperation and criticism were uh, really emerged. So um, we'll move into the next slide, please. Okay, so here we have the Red Guards, and I think people, you know, when they think about the Cultural Revolution, they've heard of the Red Guards, but the Red Guards were the students who were formed uh, by Mao or urged by Mao to make revolution, right? We're dealing with a generation of revolutionary successors, uh, people who will, who will inevitably inherit China. Um, you know, there were many different Red Guard groups uh, that engaged in a lot of revolutionary struggle. But the purpose of the Red Guards was really um, a way to keep the revolution dynamic. And again, a lot of the mainstream likes to characterize um, the Cultural Revolution and the Red Guards as overzealous young uh, people attacking and persecuting intellectuals. But really, the idea behind the Red Guards was addressing a new generation of students who were born after 1949, after the revolution. And, you know, really how do we radicalize a generation of youth to continue the revolutionary process? Mao urges these students to learn from the revolutionary tradition. You know, at this time, there was free travel around China. Uh, people were able to take the trains for free and to learn from the masses in the countryside. So the Red Guards were in a way an experiment, an experiment to see how the masses engage with the party and vice versa. Um, the Red Guards really um, engaged in this campaign that's called the Four Olds Campaign, right? Um, the, you know, uh, the old customs, ideas, habit, culture, which really was calling for a radical transformation of society from traditions of the old class society, um, everything from art, culture, education, factories, family structure. These were all elements that needed to be challenged and democratized. And so, the Cultural Revolution 
by way of the Red Guards and, and, and the people who are part of this mass movement meant boldly denouncing elements of class society, such as patriarchy, right? Um, things like um, calling for educating the masses of people where most of China was still illiterate. I mean, th there were tons of gains made in the first decade, but there's still a lot of work to be done, right? It also meant reorganizing schools where peasants and workers uh, were able to send their children to college, which still um, at the time, um, colleges were kind of reserved for a, 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 um, you know, a small privileged class of people. And so for the first time now, peasants and villagers um, and workers, their children could go to college. Um, you know, peasants also had a say in how education was gonna be carried out in their own villages, right? Workers had a say in the decision making of their factories. These are truly revolutionary policies that would transform society in a, in a radical way. And this isn't something, you know, just to, just to kind of emphasize, right? We we're now in the third class of the series and this has come up time and time again, but this is, these ideas are not things that pop up out of nowhere, right? These ideas of um, overturning the old society Ha, um, criticizing the old society. This was a part of a long trajectory of the modern revolutionary movement in China. Since you know the end of the 1800s, the, think about the reform uh, movements that ultimately led to the overthrow of the Qing dynasty, um, the May 4th movement, the new culture movement. These are all anti-colonial movements that also um, brought into question um, dismantling right? Uh, Confucianism, dismantling patriarchy, all these things. So it's just a continuation of, of just this like um, decades long struggle to, to make revolutionary change. So we'll go into the next slide. So um, we'll talk about the Shanghai Commune and basically uh, this is where in, in Shanghai workers joined the Cultural Revolution, right, which had at the time had been mostly um, uh, led by students. So these workers in Shanghai were mainly factory workers, uh, workers that worked in the shipyards, railway, who were members of two large mass organizations, and they really wanted to engage with the leadership in Beijing at the time. Um, so they hold mass rallies, but on February 5th, um, 1967, these two mass organizations, they come together and essentially dissolve the municipal party committee. And they create a commune that's modeled after the Paris commune. And this was their attempt to develop a, a uh, form of direct pro uh, proletarian democracy. It didn't necessarily explicitly eliminate or exclude the party, but it definitely transcends the role of the party. Um, However, Mao decides um, that the commune is going too far because it still needs the party to be the leading body. As you can see, it, it really only lasts for a, uh, a couple of weeks. Um, the way that Mao saw it was that, you know, you can't overthrow the party, even though it wasn't a direct overthrow of the party, the party didn't really have um, any control in, in this commune in, in, a, in a meaningful way. And so, um, you know, when we think about the Cultural Revolution, it wasn't necessarily to overthrow the party, but but to get the party to listen to the masses. Um, so Mao ends up sending Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Chenjiao to disband the commune leadership uh, of the commune. They ended up accepting this negotiation and came up with a negotiation um, that's called the three in one combination. So we'll go into the next slide and we'll describe what, what that means. So the three in one combination, um, you know, the commune dissolves itself in favor of this uh, revolutionary three in one combination, which basically three in one is party, army, masses um, in one, right? It, it was too, it, you know, they felt that it was too early to establish a workers' commune. In practice, the three in one combination really put the party back in the leading role, right? The PLA and the party were closely integrated. Um, and this is the reassertion of party leadership, which then changes the course of the Cultural Revolution, such that the conflict of the Cultural Revolution becomes one of who is actually going to be the leadership of the party, right? The question about the party versus the masses is, is resolved at this point, right? It's the party that leads. And so um, 
you know, in this section, we're talking really about the factional conflict and party infighting, which I think there's just a lot of nuance here that we won't be able to cover, but I'll try to go through some of these points um, with as much clarity as I can. Um, but the Wuhan mutiny incident of July 1967 is a struggle that breaks out uh, for power between opposing forces. Um, and this was seen as a turning point in the Cultural Revolution, right? There was, there were a lot of uh, potential for factional, inf uh, factional conflict within the People's Liberation Army, uh, which could have spilled over into a, a real civil war and different factions within the army, you know, emerged. There were um, very tense moments and the party realized that what they really needed to focus on was to rebuild the unity within the party. And so Joan Lai was sent down to uh, Wuhan to arbitrate this situation. And this is where the central party leadership asserts control over the People's Liberation Army. Um, at this time, the summer of 67 and 68, the Red Guards are sent to the countryside um, to learn from the masses, right? Again, you know, urban educated youth sent to the countryside to learn uh, from the villagers, the party cadre were sent out as well. And after the Wuhan incident, uh, um, you know, there was a period of reconsolidation of the party, um, control leadership and the movement, uh, leadership of the movement and the People's Liberation Army. And so the Cultural Revolution here then devolves into a struggle for power within the many factions of the party, right? There were two major points, right? They were dealing with who's going to be the dominant force in the party. And the other point was to try to ensure that the party can reestablish leadership in institutions such as the People's Liberation Army, right? The party really needed to unite the People's Liberation Army and reestablish it as a reliable force. Next slide. So here we have the Ninth Party Congress um, that takes place in April 1969, where Lin Biao is named as Mao's official successor. This is the point where uh, the Cultural Revolution as a political mass movement is over. Um, now the Cultural Revolution, as stated earlier, is a matter of conflict within the leadership and developmental procedures of China. Next slide. So we've also heard about the Gang of Four. I'm sure people have, have you know, been, um, you know, have heard of uh, what the Gang of Four is, but let's talk about a little bit what the Gang of Four was. So the Gang of Four emerged in the wake of the Ninth Party Congress um, and is used to describe the remaining faction of, the, of Mao's left wing of the party. Um, and this, this line of maintaining um, criticism of bureaucracy within the party. However, their major focus of attention uh, was of the cultural arena, right? By developing the cultural superstructure. Um, while they are mainly appealing to the masses, um, they're not necessarily mobilizing the masses. It becomes more ideological. So Jiang Qing, who's the, the wife of Mao, is the driving force of this, right? This Here we see an era of revolutionary opera, literature, an era of ideological struggle. Um, you know, and people will see these operas and engage in, in, in debates, right? Um, but it's different from organizing the masses, organizing the mass movement. They don't really have a mass base here. They want mass participation, but they don't have the organizational mechanism to, to build that. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't significant contributions, right? Um, a lot of the revolutionary uh, art that comes out of this, the cultural art that comes out of this is, is, is still very much impactful. Um, but again, this is the struggle within uh, the cultural superstructure. So this is the gang of four. This is one side, again, of, of, of the, um, of the conflicts that come up in, in the party. So the next slide, you know, we hear about Deng Xiaoping. So Deng Xiaoping is uh, the leader of the other side of the faction, right? The pragmatist side of the faction um, of the party. He's been purged and restored several times. Um, you know, Deng Xiaoping's economic policies of development really caused him um, to be purged from the party during the Cultural Revolution, along with Liu Xiaoqi. And to be clear, 
Um, just wanted to clarify for folks that, you know, Deng was always a communist. He was a student of Marxism and Leninism since the 20s, fought alongside Mao. And it really wasn't until the years leading up to the Cultural, cultural Revolution did the differences in opinion um, regarding development really began to emerge. So in 1972, he was in charge of the four modernizations um, of agriculture, industry, defense, science, technology. That's the institutional base, right? That's the material base of expanding production, enhancing China's military capabilities, right? Deng was, was in some ways already controlling this side of the material production of the economic base. So the struggle between two lines is a struggle between how best to build a socialist China. Um, but the four modernizations are all about how to rebuild China, uh, rebuild, rebuild China as a socialist China. The Gang of Force perspective was that the policies that Deng and his faction would pursue would spontaneously generate capitalism, which of course is, is why the Gang of Four opposed it, understandably, right? Um, but because Deng and because of his position uh, in the party, because he basically controlled um, the four modernizations, his faction were the ones making the development in the party to move forward um, economically. So when the political conflict between these two factions is finally resolved, they're the ones in the dominant position because they're the ones who are already developing policy to build the economy. So we'll go into the next slide. So here we see that Nixon is visiting China um, and we'll talk about what happens here, right? Mao revises his primary contradiction, right? The contradiction, which was once, you know, revolutionary socialism and American capitalist imperialism. Um, it changes from that um, to the fact that the US is a spent force, right? This is at the, you know, after the Vietnam War the primary contradiction is not with the US, but now in China's view with social imperialists, the Soviets, right, as a primary threat to China. And this is, of course, a continuation of the Sino-Soviet split, the deterioration of those two relationships. Um, and so the secret negotiations uh, between Kissinger, Nixon, and Mao take place in 1971. And from Mao's perspective, allying with the Americans would ward off what he perceived to be the threat from the Soviet Union at the time, right? But from the American perspective, they were thrilled to exploit the conflict that emerged from the Sino-Soviet split. Um, again, driving a wedge between these two sister socialist countries that should be working together. President Nixon visits China in February as a further step towards US-China rapprochement. Um, during Nixon's stay, the U.S. and China issue what's called the Shanghai Communique. And this document pledges that the countries will work to normalize their relations. Um, the U.S. government here formally recognizes the principle that Taiwan is a part of China. From a socialist perspective, it is absolutely normal for socialist countries to, to try and seek normalization of relations uh, with imperialist countries. So this is what, what happens um, between the US and China during this time. Let's go into the next slide. So 1976 is a tumultuous year. Um, lots of deaths take place. You know, we see the death of Zhou Enlai in January 8th. We see the Tiananmen incident in April 5th. And this basically was an incident that happened the evening before the Qingming Festival, which is um, is the sh is in Chinese culture, it's the street sweeping festival where Chinese people pay homage to their ancestors. You, know, you clean up everything, you pay homage to your ancestors, and so uh, the masses really came out um, to Tiananmen Square to lay wreaths to commemorate um, Zhou and Lai. However, um, when Zhou and Lai before his death, he was elected the first vice chairman of the Communist Party after the 10th Party Congress. He um, engaged in a, a, quite a, a bit of struggle with the Gang of Four. Um, and because the Gang of Four was criticized for this struggle by the masses of people who went out to commemorate uh, Zhou Enlai um, during, um, you know, in April 5th, 
Um, this led the Gang of Four to characterize the Tiananmen incident um, as counter-revolutionary, right? So again, just, just echoing that they're, they're quite removed from the masses at this point. We also see the death of Zhu Dei um, in July 6, who is a prominent leader of the Communist Party of China. Um, he was a military leader, founder of the Red Army. Um, in July 28th, there's a massive 7.6 earthquake that takes place in Tangshan, which is a coal mining industry, uh, industrial city. This was a horrible natural disaster that led to the collapse of most buildings. There was a death toll of 200,000 to 700,000 people estimated. And then September 9th, we see the death of Mao, um, Chairman Mao. And then um, on October 6th, we see the arrest of the Gang of Four, right? Um, they were charged with for the excesses of the Cultural Revolution. Um, once the chairman, uh, or Chairman Mao was gone, the mainstream of the party reasserts itself and sweeps away the Gang of Four that immediately leads to, to the reemergence of Deng Xiaoping. Um, and within two years, he comes back into uh, a role of leadership. So next slide. So when, when Mao dies, when, when Mao and Zhou and Lai die, uh, there was a brief tenure of Hua Guofeng as chairman. Um, and, you know, this period, Deng really gets back involved in practical work, right? He comes back to Beijing. Um, he struggles for leadership in the party and has a broader base of support uh, within the party. You know, the Gang of Four is gone now. There's a work conference that takes place in 1978 uh, where Deng gives the, the final summary report of this work conference. And it's kind of a symbolic moment where he's back as a leader, right? He's now articulating what the line is gonna be moving forward. The work conference is where they start to talk about all the different reforms that, um, that are needed to carry forward the revolution, right? This is the very beginning. He talks about the very beginnings of the experiment of the one child policy, the policies that really come out in the 80s is laid out in this final summary report at this work conference. Um, this was the first time, uh, you know, that these policies were publicly articulated. And so he's kind of publicly acknowledged at this point as a dominant figure. He doesn't become the chairman of the party or the president or the prime minister, but he's clearly the de facto uh, leader at this time. Next slide. And so this brings us to this question, right? Taking the capitalist road. Well, what happens, right? When Deng becomes the de facto leader, um, landmark reforms from the Cultural Revolution were reversed, but also the rehabilitation of the cadres who had been purged during the Cultural Revolution and were sent to the re-education uh, labor camps. They were all brought back, um, you know, their roles were restored, their reputations were restored, they were considered rehabilitated. Um, this was kind of the wiping slate of cadre uh, who had been on the losing side, they were brought back. So of course they were huge fans of Deng and, and the reform program. Um, on the other side, there was not a wholesale purge of the cultural revolution leftists. They were all still around too. So, you know, when we're thinking about the question of capitalist rotor, right? One would think that um, the cultural revolution leftists would have been purged, but they weren't. They were not purged during this time. They were still involved. Um, the party begins to set about tasks of evaluating Mao and his policies, evaluating the legacy of Mao and the cultural revolution. Um, and then we begin to see the policy initiatives that takes shape in the 80s, right? So the population control, um, agricultural reforms, uh, SOEs, the state-owned uh, enterprises. Um, and so it makes it clear here too um, that the state-owned enter enterprises will be the core of the economy. Once again, demonstrating that it's not taking a capitalist road because they're socialist enterprises. That's, that's what gives a party the state and the state the ability to guide and manage the overall process of development. Um, and then of course, foreign direct investment. So is this taking the capitalist road or is this pursuing socialism, right? The emphasis here is what's the, again, just 
at the very beginning of, of this section of the class is the two line struggles about what's the best way to build towards a socialist China. The rhetoric at the moment, um, you know, the, you know, at this point, the Deng side of the faction um, basically takes control. And the problem was, you know, there were deep differences of opinion in, in this, right? What's the actual content? What's the system in practice? How do we actually build socialism? Um, and the problem was that the Gang of Four allowed themselves to be alienated and marginalized from the masses. Um, that allowed them to be arrested. Deng led the economic reforms to open China's markets. This plan allows the U.S. to have direct foreign investment in China. Deng Xiaoping was a, a pragmatist. He felt that the economic development in China had to be done by capitalist methods rather than socialist methods, even though socialist methods were working, even if it was at a slower pace. Um, but we have the final two classes of this series to really hash out what this really means. And so just to kind of conclude and, and summarize, so this class, you know, we just talked about a lot of dense content and I wanna just acknowledge um, again, that the period between 1949 and 1979, you know, the Great Leap Forward, the Sino-Soviet split, there's so much more about the Sino-Soviet split that we did not cover, the Cultural Revolution, these all kind of deserve its own course of its own. Uh, we have really only just scratched the surface, but today we learned really about how China under, underwent many different policies to achieve development, to meet the needs of the people, all under the pressure of a deteriorating relationship with the USSR. And understanding the continuity from the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and the compounding effects of the Sino-Soviet split are really critical, uh, especially because the historical time periods are often mischaracterized and you know, are a source of anti-China propaganda. So without these major historical moments in China's development, we really could not begin to understand what we'll cover for the next class, really addressing this question. The central question is China capitalist. We'll learn about the uh, China socialist market economy and quest towards socialism. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my section. I realize I went way over, I'm so sorry, but if there are any kind of final questions, I'll be happy to take those. And of course, Ken, jump in whenever you can. Yeah, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, I really appreciate how you connected and contextualized that period of history that you just covered with what's going on now around the US and our um, daily lives as workers. So thank you for another amazing presentation this week. Um, so we'll just ask a few questions because it is a little late. Um, so why don't we just start with uh, what are the present day effects of the socialist education movement? You know, some of these folks are still around um, and have really contributed to China today. So if you could um, elaborate on some of the effects of this program that we see today in China. And then um, I'll give you one more. So what exactly um, were the Red Guards learning from going to the countryside? Were they just kind of um, observing how the countryside or were they taking directions from them directly or party members or sort of some type of combination of those three? So we'll start with that. Great. Um, I mean, what are the present effects of the socialist education movement? I think just the, the radicalization of the youth right I, I don't i kind of feel the same same thing with the red guards going to the countryside i think both of these right we're seeing really like sending the youth to to see what the revolutionary process could look like in the in the in the countryside i think it was is deeply radicalizing so i think the effects really are just creating a whole generation of people who who kind of are understanding how to carry out the revolution that it's not just you know being in the urban centers and seeing the way it's developing there but that there are a lot of contradictions still in the countryside um and i think that's what the red guards were learning from the countryside at that time in terms of how they were you know being educated in the countryside that i don't have too much detail about um but maybe that this is something that um ken can shed some light on yeah. yeah, well, the, the, the experience, I mean, when the Red Guards, there's, there's sort of two phases. There's the first phase, uh, 66, 67 into 68, where young people were given the right to travel for free on the, on the nation's railways. And, and Chairman Mao exhorted them to go out and 
visit the sites of revolutionary struggle, go down to Jiangxi to where the first Soviet was, uh, go along parts of uh, the route of the Long March, things like this, uh, to re-engage with the revolutionary struggle. I mean, young people in the late 60s, they had all been born uh, you know, either right around or just after liberation. And so this was a way to encourage them to, to get back, to, to connect to the history and, the, and the, the legacy of the revolution. And a lot of that went on. But then there's a second phase uh, beginning in 68 that carries on down through, through the end of the 70s when young people were, were as they call, as they say, sent down, sent out to live in the countryside. And that's, that's the phase where they lived in villages, they worked alongside uh, 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 local farmers. Often they, they came to be uh, teachers or what were called barefoot doctors or uh, uh, people who provided other kinds of, of uh, services. They didn't really know a lot about, about farming to begin with, but they learned about that. The idea was to, to gain direct experience of the hardship, but also the, the struggle that went on in the countryside. And so I think um, that's, if you, if you talk to former Red Guards now, or you read a lot of the Red Guard memoirs and all this, that's really, that's, that was the heart of the experience. There's a couple of, uh, of books on our reading list that deal with the, the cultural revolution in the countryside that talk about, about this, this period pretty, pretty nicely. Great, thank you both for those responses. Um, and then we'll just ask one last one. Um, how successful was the cultural revolution in the goal of getting the party to actually um, listen to the masses? And then just kind of an informal question. I know you covered a lot of information in your presentation and we appreciate how much making such a um, concise presentation with so much history, but if there's anything you wanna add or Ken would like to add um, about Anything you presented on, go ahead and do that too um, after answering the question. Yes, I mean, I would say just given like the intensity of the Cultural Revolution, I think it was pretty successful in some ways, you know. Um, it's it's a revolutionary process. It's, it's something that people still reference today. Um, but in terms of anything else I would like to add, you know, the Cultural Revolution, when it was happening, and even today, the legacy of the Cultural Revolution was deeply inspirational. I think around the world, um, when the Cultural Re Revolution was was taking place, this idea of, um, you know, Mao calling on the masses to criticize their own government, um, to keep their government accountable, that was deeply inspiring. You know, this is taking place in the 60s, uh, late 60s. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that it was successful. I, I, I mean, I don't, you know, just because the Gang of Four was arrested and that left-wing faction of, of, the, um, of the party was jailed, I don't think that, that really means that then everything was reverted. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons learned from the Cultural Revolution that still carry out today. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, <laughs> The Cultural Revolution was, was a, a, an intense revolutionary conflict. Um, and it, it certainly, uh, people, there was a period where people came out of that and felt a little battered and all that. Um, but I think that in, in a long-term perspective, when people in China today look back, and this is, you know, people who lived through the Cultural Revolution and younger people today looking back at that legacy, I think that many people see the Cultural Revolution as a, as a struggle to, to, uh, to try to make the party and the, and the government more responsive to the needs of the people. And, uh, and I think that, that that's a good legacy that, that a lot of people still embrace today. And I also think, you know, in, in, in ways that, uh, I don't know how substantive it is, there's a certain, I suppose you could almost say nostalgia. I know that in, in Beijing, uh, I spent a lot of time in Beijing, and, and one of the things that's fun to do there is go down to some of the parks, especially the big park down by the Temple of Heaven, where a lot of, a lot of older people, a lot of people from that generation, you know, hang out and gather and all this. And uh, there's a lot of, um, of singing that goes on. Mm -hmm. And if you listen, they're singing songs from the Cultural Revolution. 
they're singing songs about solidarity. They're singing songs about working together and helping people and building a new China and a better China. It's, um, I, I think that there's a lot of the legacy of that period. People don't want to live through intense political struggle and factionalism and all that stuff every day. But I think that the, the takeaway from that period is largely, uh, largely positive. We hear a lot in Western bourgeois circles that, oh, the, you can't talk about the Cultural Revolution in China. And that's just nonsense. People talk about it all the time. Uh, uh, there's museums about it. It's taught in school. You know, this, this, this idea that it's, it's sort of hidden away and hushed up is just nonsense. But I think that, that when people think about it, and as I say, both young people today and, and certainly people who live through it, that, that the long-term perspective is, is pretty positive. Yeah, um, and I, I guess the last thing I'll add too, like just from my own personal experience, you know, my my parents and their generation, um, they grew up during the Cultural Revolution. You know, my all my my mom's entire school age, my parents' entire school age was during the period of, you know, 1966 to 1976. And so, um, for when I talk, when I asked my mom about the Cultural Revolution and what that was like for her, um, you know, very limited ability to understand because I, I lack a lot of the political um, language in Chinese, but she was like, you know, we, we went to school and then we went and worked, you know, at our, in our neighborhood crop. Like that's just the way life was. It was not this like bad punitive thing. It was like, this was just a part of normal life in China, right? It's not weird or anything like that. You know, my grandma went to the meetings where they would evaluate party officials, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah. And, and just on the point of the, the, the art piece, I mean, culture and art and opera is such a big part of, of Chinese society. Now, you know, my, my parents were not a part of the elite. They were my, my dad's family, they were peasants, but they, you know, a part of the way that they socialize with their friends is through like listening to like a lot of like, um, what feels like, old modern or like old school um, opera that I think came out of that period. I can't say for sure, but it feels that way um, just based off of my research and what I've heard. So, yeah. Great, well, thank you both for your presentations and um, answering those questions. Um, I know everyone's had a long day of protest and action yesterday, maybe even today, and we learned a lot. So I'll pass the floor to Satya to close this up. Thank you so much again to Ken and Sheila uh, for their excellent presentations and for everyone who asked questions and made comments today um, in the discussion. Um, so we hope to uh, we hope that all of you will join us again next Sunday on June 7th. Um, and those that class will be taught by the Chow Collective and it will focus on China's socialist market economy and the uh, quest towards socialism. Great, and we have just a few reminders for the upcoming week. Uh, every Thursday, the Party for Socialism and Liberation presents a national forum uh, live streamed on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Tune in this Thursday, June 4th. And then also be sure to follow us on social media at PSL Web and visit liberationnews.org for our take on current events. And remember, thinking about socialism is good, thinking and talking about socialism is better but building a revolutionary socialist party is best of all. If you're interested in joining the PSL, you can apply online today at pslweb.org backslash join. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you.